one in. So this is the intake tent. So this is the point where all the dirty birds, the birds that are covered in oil, um, in various stages are being brought in. And working in this tent, we have a Massey Uni fifth year veterinary student who's doing a week's work experience or part of her clinical experience with us. Alice, Henry there. And Sarah Michael up the end is the vet in charge of this tent and she's one of our residents at the Wildlife Centre. Vet in the middle, Nigel Doherty, is being trained up to, to replace um, uh, Sarah so she can have a break. And Nigel's a, a private wet vet working in private practice from Tiana who's come up to give us a hand. So the, the little penguins are brought in here with varying degrees of oil. Some have been 100% covered in oil, others have been just a trace of oil on him. And this little guy is, is what we would call a lightly oiled bird, which means he has enough oil on him that it's broken the waterproofing in his feathers. Um, and it means that if he goes in the water, it's, the water's going to soak in and chill him down and eventually he'll drown. He also tries to preen that oil off and the oil has toxic effects on them. It breaks down their red blood cells. Um, it also affects their liver and their kidney. Um, so they're not going to survive if we leave them out in the wild. So they have to be brought in and they have to be treated. The guys are all wearing the protective gear, the Tyvex overalls and the nitrile gloves, which will protect them from the hydrocarbons being absorbed when they're handling them again. Right. And how do you think the, the Massey Vets have been doing in this? We're doing really well. I mean, it's, it's, it's breaks your heart to be here. We didn't want this to happen, but it's something that we've actually been training and preparing for for nearly 16 years now. Right. And we've been involved in small regional spills like the Awakino spill where a tank went into a river. Um, we've been involved in the JDF Millennium where a log carrier went aground. There was a small spill of oil. But this is by far and away the biggest New Zealand event we've been involved in. Yeah, this is the worst possible time of year for there to be an oil spill because this is right in the middle of the breeding season for all of these birds. So for the penguin, the team's going out catching penguins, there's occasionally eggs, there's occasionally chicks. In the dotrels, there have been eggs that we've had to leave on the beach. And some breeding birds have had to be removed from their nests, which is obviously very, very stressful for them. Hi, Capra. So you can see in here what we've done is we've actually created a ducted heating system for the marquee because these birds have lost the ability to maintain their body heat. So in here we've got the temperature set at somewhere between 23 to 25 degrees. So it's keeping it warm and then the, when the birds come in they get sit on trampoline beds in these fruit crates that we've modified and that will keep them warm until they've re been washed and regained the ability to do it. Now normally they would go through here into the washroom. We're going to go around and look at it from the other side so that we don't take oil from this side round into the clean area. Okay. Pauline go ahead, Brett over. You'd make a wonderful trucky. Where about for you? I'm taking the Massey film crew around. I'm in the washroom right now. Okay. This area here, we're standing on the clean rinse side of the wash tent. So the, uh, so the birds that are coming through here up into this area are oiled and then they are washed here. So what we've got set up here is a plumbing system that brings in water that's heated to the bird's body temperature. It's heated up to 41 degrees. It's softened so that there's no crystals being deposited onto the feathers and mucking up the waterproofing. And we go through somewhere between 500 to 1,000 litres of water for, to, to wash the oil off the birds. We can get the oil off the birds in about 30 to 40 minutes of washing. Now for a wild bird that's offering a long period of time to be handled and stressed. But so that's why they've got to be strong and strengthened up in the stabilisation area before they're brought through here. When we're washing them, we're aerosolising the oil, oily water mix, so that everyone who's washing is wearing face shields, they're wearing the, the, the aprons and they're wearing the long gloves that you can see hanging up over here, um, which are drying, to just to make sure that we never get any oil on skin. Okay. Once they're fully washed, which goes 30, 40 minutes, they come through into the rinse container. Do you need me? Or? Okay. So this is a containerized facility that's been made by Dwyer Tech, the, um, the guys who you'll see running around campus looking after the, the facility. And they've been working with us for the last 10 years or so. And Bill Dwyer has designed and built this container so that in the event of an oil spill, we just pick it up from Massey, we throw it on a truck and we take it and plonk it down and it forms the nucleus of, of the Wildlife Re Response Centre. So in the early stages of the response, all of the washing and all of the rinsing was done in here. Now that we've expanded up and we're washing 40 birds a day, this area has become just a rinsing station. 
and so we've got the piped water coming through, we've got the extraction fans to keep, keep the, the uh, moisture out of the air, and we've got drainage systems to cope with the excess water and things like that. So we're now fully in the clean area, and so the birds that are coming out through that door there are washed, they've got all the oil off them and they're clean, and they're going down into the clean tent, which was where we'll head now. So in this room, we've got birds that are recovering from a wash, so they'll sit in here under the, the air blowers, warm air blowers, and they'll dry them off and they'll get dry. But the other birds have actually been out of the wash for a few days. They're going back and forth to the pools, but they're still not fully waterproof yet. And so for those birds, they'll be in here for, for four or five days before we start moving so them into our water enclosures. Once they're at that there was point, another type they're ready to be released. Type, All we need is a safe spot to release them. But as we've said, we may have to hold them for three or four months before they go. So the teams working in here are not wearing the safety gear that you saw in the earlier so areas the next because thing that this is a clean area. area. So there's no there's oil in here whatsoever. Um, and, and we actually have separate teams, teams working in those areas to maintain that difference as well. Because the last thing we want is to get oil on a penguin that's already been washed because then it goes right back through to the start of the thing. We're interested in it, but all the oily waste has to be collected. So when we, the water that's coming off the washers or the water that's coming out of the cages when they're being cleaned that contains oil is all collected up in these sump tanks and then has to be taken away and dealt with separately. So there's a huge waste issues. We don't want to contaminate the area with oily water or anything like that. We don't want it going into the general mains. So we, and that's again where, where Dwyer Tech works really well with us is they make sure that all of this works works without us creating problems. Sorry. So the pool here is for our flighted birds and you'll see the pied shags and things in here tomorrow mm -hmm. and so the birds can, that it can fly are in here and, and they won't go away but the penguins obviously can't fly so we've got them in these pools and they come out and spend as much of the day as they can swimming because if you get a penguin swimming its stress levels drop right off and they're much much happier. It's also the site where we bring stressed responders. Watching a penguin swim lowers everybody's blood pressure down. It's fresh water so we're supplementing them with salt in the diet and before they go out what we'll do is actually in, put salt into a pool to prepare their salt glands and everything for readiness to release. But if we put salt water into the water we have trouble with where our overflow goes and where our sump goes because we can't put that into the wastewater areas. Well, planning is never quite like the real thing, but we have, I think, performed well. We've, we've managed to get this facility up and running, in, and we had people on the ground here in less than uh, 24 hours. We had a washing and hospital facility let up, set up in 48 hours, and the tent city that you've just gone through and seen has developed over the course of a week. And it's all because of the network and partnerships that we built prior to the event you couldn't come in here cold and set this thing up in time to be able to do it. So it's been a really good relationship for them. Massey University and Maritime New Zealand have had for the last 16 years a contract for us to provide training and preparedness for just this sort of event. So we've been over the years developing our equipment and our people and our skills so that if something like this happens we have the capacity to, to try and mitigate the effects of the oil on the wildlife. So we work in very closely with Maritime New Zealand's oil pollution guys and we have, for instance, Kerry and Helen sitting in the Incident Command Centre feeding in the wildlife information to them and for them feeding it back to us so that we can coordinate our response the best that we can. It's been a long-standing uh, collaboration between the two organisations and it's worked really, really well. But this is the first time that we've really fully tested out the, the, the wildlife capability. Up to now it's been regional responses, small-scale events, or tier three events like where the JDF Millennium came aground but not a lot of oil was released. In this case we have a large spill of oil, a large number of wildlife affected and so it's really testing us out. Shadi, is all of the wildlife team from the university here? No, well, there's a big core of, of the wildlife team is from the university, but we also use experts from other organisations as well. So, for instance, we have six people come over from the US in the International Bird Rescue Centre. We're from New Zealand. We have shorebird ecologists working to go out and capture dotterels for interest and things like that. And we have ornithologists working as our field capture guys. So this is the first time in 10 years that we've actually closed down the wildlife clinic that runs within the vet hospital, which gives you some indication of how significant we think this is. 
Um, so we've pulled all of our staff out and we need them all up here so that we can actually run this thing and, and give our people you know, some rostered days off and things like that because we've been running for nearly two weeks now and it looks like we'll be running for months so we've got to keep rostering our people around so they don't burn out. And how significant is this event in terms of our wildlife? This is officially the biggest oil spill that New Zealand has had and certainly been the biggest wildlife impact that it has. The Bay of Plenty region is one of the richest areas we have for seabirds um, and there's a, there is a Ramsar listed site for shorebirds in this area as well. The most important species we have in terms of conservation priorities is the dotterel, which there's only 1,700 birds left and this is the second biggest breeding site for that species in New Zealand. So it's a, a, a in terms of biodiversity, it's a really wealthy area. Um, it's also happening at a time which is the worst possible time, the breeding season for most of these species. So um, if you wanted to pick a worst place in New Zealand to have a spill, you'd have to look really, really hard.